Hello, this is Dr. Harriet Prad with Capitalism Hits Home, a show about the intersection of personal lives with political economy. It's brought to you by Democracy at Work. And I want to thank Democracy at Work for all the wonderful work they do, including this program, which I hope is wonderful for you. Of course, we want your feedback if it is, if it isn't, if there's aspects that inspire or disgust, let us know. Okay, today I want to talk about something I, I guess I think of as D-Day because it's all of these different things about America's sad place that begin with D. I'll begin with one which is both an economic entity in the United States, an economic reality, but also an emotional one, and that's depression. Because what I'll talk about is depression and ways that Americans have dealt with it. And they are depression that comes first, and then dissociation, denial, and displacement. Now, what's dissociation? That's a psych term. Dissociation is a talent that every child needs. It's the only way kids can get out of their family in their own mind. So when things are rough, you can just space out. You can be somewhere else while appearing to be compliant and a good boy or girl. It's just having your mind detached from the reality around you. We're dissociated when we're in the movies or we see something that's really compelling and we're dissociated enough that, let's say it's a film about being underwater, like the film My Octopus, where he's swimming underwater relating to this octopus. And we really feel we're there. And yet if somebody yells fire and we realize there's a fire in our house, or if we smell smoke, we don't say, I, I don't have to worry, I'm underwater. We know that we're both underwater, but we're also in our house watching a film or in a movie theater watching a film. We can be two places at once, one place in our own mind and another place physically. That's dissociation where you go somewhere else in your own mind and just tune out to a reality that's, that you don't want to tune into. Another is denial. And denial has both colloquial, ordinary terms, but in psychology, it's where you deny a reality. If your parents are screaming and yelling, you can deny that they're out of control. You can think there must be a good reason. Or if my parent is beating me, it must be because I'm bad. I deny that this person on whom my life depends is utterly out of control. So it's a way of knowing something, but denying its realness. And another one is displacement. Displacement in psychology is where you have a feeling that comes from one place, but you dissociate and you blame it on another place. So let's say you're really angry that the boss has oppressed you, that you've been on speed up and it's untenable. And then you come home and your partner says something slightly inconsiderate and you scream. What you're doing is displacing the rage that you felt at work onto your partner. And you do that because the feeling had no place to go before or no safe place to go. And so you displace it because feelings are kind of like water. If you press them down in one place, they'll pop up in another. And so that if you're angry or upset in one situation where you feel you can't express it like at work, it'll come out later. You'll kick the dog, you'll yell at your wife, you'll scream at your kids, something that's destructive and rageful to vent that anger. And this, these psychological terms really do describe what's happened to America. 
Starting in the 1970s, as I've said before, and certainly by about 1978, millions upon millions of American jobs were outsourced to China so capitalists could make bigger profits. And it was practical to do so because by the time the late 70s arrived, we had very swift jet travel to different places. if We needed to be physically there. We also had highly refined computers that could communicate to people overseas. We also had robotics that could do jobs here or overseas. We had fax machines and other things that made it so easy to do business abroad. And that became very attractive because then American capitalists could invest in places like China, Bangladesh, India, where they could pay people ridiculously smaller sums. The Chinese are among the best paid in Asia. They get about $3.25 an hour. And whereas in Pakistan, you can get paid 99 cents an hour. Plus those countries didn't have the kind of ecological restrictions and requirements, plus eight-hour days or sick days or any of the other things that Americans won with their strikes and their protests at often great cost. I should mention that about 60% of the companies in China that Americans complain about had big American investment. And so that what happened wasn't that the Chinese somehow on their own started to gang up on us, but that American capitalists felt they could make more money by exporting well-paid, often unionized jobs to China and other countries where they were not accountable and they could make more money. And when they did that, a whole sector of American manufacturing was gone. And also a sector of unionized jobs was gone. We didn't have the kind of powerful socialist and communist um, trade union movements that they have in places like France and Germany. And so outsourcing wasn't forbidden. I should say France, Germany, all of Scandinavia. So outsourcing wasn't forbidden. And therefore, people could just abandon a town and its inhabitants, abandon millions of people from well-paying jobs that supported their families in order to make more money for themselves and their stockholders. And that's what they did. And because of that, men's salaries went down, unionized jobs were lost, capitalists didn't any longer have to pay a family wage that could support a wife and children. Though, as I should say, this is all racialized as everything in America is, because those jobs, those well-paying jobs, were reserved for white males. There was a period during World War II where those restrictions were lifted because there were so many white men in the military, but they were reasserted when the war was over and the white men got back. At any rate, so that we had a mass dispossession. This is part of what has caused the depression of American spirit. And with it, the idea that you could work at a factory job, you could get seniority on that job, you could go to a little store in your neighborhood where they knew you, and they knew you had a position in the community, you could have a stable marriage based on a family wage and supporting that household. Your children could have a future maybe working in the same factory in the same town or going beyond that, or at least in a different place from that. And so that there was a whole emotional security that people had, where that if you were white and male and tried to make it, you could make a decent life. You could have a stable marriage. You could have children who might have a better life, that the American dream 
could work for you. And that is no longer the case. That man who used to get some recognition at the local store or his wife and kids now goes to Walmart where no one knows who he is and who his children are and who his wife is. That man who used to be able to have a little luncheonette is replaced by McDonald's with its low wages. The little hardware store where they used to help you and you got to know them and they knew you and you were in the neighborhood is replaced by Home Depot or by Walmart. And so the jobs that were available were the kind of jobs that are dead-end jobs at low wages where no one recognizes you, where you have very little chance to advance, where you don't get a position in the community because they're usually outside of town, where people aren't unionized and don't have all the things that went with the work and the union, like the bowling league, like the buying club, like the socialization that people used to have in the groups that were associated with their jobs. Now they go there and they come back, or as in, is in more and more the case, companies save even more money by hiring temps who have no ties to anything and particularly no benefits. And so people's lives were deprived economically, depressed economically, and also depressed emotionally because there's a standing that goes with having an American dream, feeling you've succeeded, feeling connected to your family and your neighborhood and your bowling league or whatever clubs you're in. That's gone now, and people are adrift and depressed. You know, about 26% of American workers make $23 an hour, just about $23 an hour. The median wage in this country is $20 an hour. That's about the wage right in the middle. However, it doesn't have the buying power it used to because things are more expensive and because things are more polarized. Even public schools that used to be neighborhood public schools where children who had were from families with more money and less money mingled could get to know one another. If your parents didn't know how to file a college application, maybe a friend of yours' mother or father would help you. That's gone too, as the people at the top made huge money by exporting jobs and computerizing and robotizing people's jobs. They took that money back from overseas and invested in buying our politicians to make very unfriendly laws for working people. And buying the politicians to the extent that people didn't often even bother to vote. At any rate, people were depressed because they lost a whole lot in their lives. Because when economic things happen, like outsourcing, robotizing, and computerizing jobs, there are enormous emotional ramifications. As the family wage was no longer given to men, I should say white men, minority men did not get family wages. But as they were given to men, men could support dependent wives and children. When those wages were exported, well, they never paid the people as much, but when their jobs were exported and outsourced, women poured into the workforce. The majority of the American women are in the workforce. That didn't happen. In the early 60s, there was about 25% of women in the workforce. Now, especially before COVID, there were about 70% of women in the workforce with children under three. So we're talking about something different. The old family 
based on the wage earning male who is taking care of when he gets home, whose wife does the cooking and the cleaning, takes care of the children, does the social work of connecting that man to friends by inviting them over, and to family, and to relatives, and to children, and does the child care, and maybe volunteers because she doesn't have to work, volunteers for the PTA or other neighborhood groups, that's over. Women are now in the workforce and don't necessarily want to come home and have to take care of everything else, all the emotional work, all the social connection, as well as the cooking and cleaning and the sex when they get home. And so marriage began to break. It began to break in the way that it had in the black community much earlier, as black men that didn't get a family wage. For the first time in American history, the majority of women are now single. And the majority of people who actually marry split. They either get 50% get either get a legal divorce or a legal separation, and about another conservatively 15 to 20% just split because they don't have assets or children to fight over. So they just part ways. That's a total revolution in the household. And men who had a privileged position as wage earners, white men who had a, that privileged position, no longer have it. And we can see from the surge of bizarre and violent white supremacy that there are many white men who resent that. At any rate, depression sets in, because people's emotional lives no longer have the moorings that held them up in marriage and connection with others, and also work-related activities and activities of women in the community, that really atrophied, and people became depressed. They also felt a whole lot less powerful. Because in our pay-to-play system, the candidates were increasingly bought and lobbyists were hired. We now have five lobbyists for every congressperson who then got legislation passed that were not beneficial to the ordinary person. Another cause of American depression is that everything's been commodified and one can't pick up anything or even get on a bus without seeing ads, which everyone knows lie to you. You're surrounded by lies. It's depressing. And so Americans not only have had an economic depression in our lives, but an emotional one as well. Now, one of the reactions to a really bad situation is dissociation. You just kind of go somewhere else in your own mind and don't face it. So increasingly, Americans got a lot fatter as they sat in front of their screens eating junk food that was advertised on those same screens, eating Cheetos, Fritos, Doritos, and other finger foods that may not have any nutrition, but they have a lot of fat and sugar. It's gotten to the point where in some states, like West Virginia, they have double-wide coffins and they need cranes to lower people because people have gained so much weight from sitting around looking at screens which are sold to them as a way of dissociating and not paying attention to anything, not paying attention to the politics that dispossesses them not paying attention to what has to be done and what's happened to them, but just going off in their own minds. And another way of just really dissociating is to dissociate with some aid of opioids or other drugs. A 100,000 people died between 1919 I'm sorry, 2019 
and 2020. They died of overdoses. Those overdoses took a great leap forward when the capitalist company, Sackler, bought all sorts of marketing devices and doctors and hospitals to push OxyContin, a highly addictive drug. And they also got the FDA to okay it as a 12-hour drug, even knowing from their experiments that it only lasts for eight hours and leaves people desperate and in pain and desperate for more. And so opioid addiction is another way of dissociating. You go into whatever place you're in, which is not in the middle of the problems that you might have to face. Alcoholism, of course, is another one where you go into, you drink a lot, and you're in an altered state and an altered place. So those are ways to dissociate with substances. Another way, another coping strategy with the depression that people have as they feel their future is taken away, as they worry that the American dream is over, that they are no longer safe here, that they don't feel they have a future, that they know full well, and it is true, that their children will not do better than they, but will do worse. 60% of parents who have savings give money to their children so their children can survive because the future looks dim for young people unless their parents are so privileged that they'll take care of it. As those parents who were recently arrested for buying their children's way into Ivy League schools and UCLA with big money gifts, their future looked certain because their parents would pay the way. The mass of people have a different story. They owe wild money once they've gone to school, if they've gone to school. And on average, it takes 20 years to pay that money back. But in two-fifths of the instance of college and graduate school loans, they're never paid back your whole life. They just accumulate interest. That's not a good future to look forward to. And so people dissociated from it and denied it. And the forms of denial they took are assertions we're the greatest, the greatest. America is the strongest power of the world. Even though every single war we've had since World War II, we lost. There was a draw in Korea. We lost in Vietnam. And you could have seen, if you wanted to look at television at that time, Americans grabbing helicopters, holding on, trying to get out, running because they were defeated. We lost in Iraq. We were defeated. We lost in Afghanistan, where you could again see Americans running for cover and trying to escape because we lost. But that myth, we're the greatest, the greatest. America is the most powerful winner. We're not the losers. We're not the losers in history who have lost our way of life. We're the winners, the greatest. And for those people who felt we were the greatest until uppity women and African Americans and immigrants took that greatness away, can say, make America great again. As, and they're in denial of where we failed and why we failed and what we can do. They're in denial of the fact that China is ahead of us in the most important technological sectors. That China has 12 high-speed trains racing across China. We have none. Most of Europe has one. We have none. That they have beautiful transit systems. The New York subways are scary now, and they're very dirty. If you go on a subway in Germany, 
or France, it's a whole different story. But people are in denial of that. Another way that they've coped is something in psychology called displacement, as I mentioned before, where the feelings caused by one thing are vented on another thing. And one of the displacements is that it's the immigrants who are responsible for our loss of a dream and our loss of a hope and our loss of a future in America. Or it's African Americans trying to hone in on our jobs or women trying to hone in our jobs or the Chinese who brought us the virus. Another denial, which is also denial and displacement, is guns, which have become so popular. It's really interesting that in the beginning of the pandemic, after it was announced that there is a pandemic, gun sales went up 40%, as if people could shoot a disease. But it was a displacement. I will protect myself. Guns were promoted to protect men and give them back their manhood because you are in charge. Nobody messes with you, even though they've taken your job, they've taken your house, they've taken your wife out of the home, they've taken your kid's future, but nobody messes with you because you've got guns. And increasingly in the pandemic, women's guns ownership went up. Women hadn't been so into guns before. But there were huge increases. In Harper's Magazine, there's a story of a gun dealer who comes back after taking a week and a half off at the beginning of the pandemic, sees his store, and thinks it was robbed. There's nothing left. But his assistant comes out and tells him, we're sold out for the first time in their history. He had to go around to pawn shops to buy guns temporarily till the ones he ordered came in because Americans were in denial of the threats that faced them. And they thought they could take care of those threats with guns. That's why there are 21 states now with permitless carry. People can buy hidden guns and carry them. They can't take them into restaurants or classrooms, but they can take them into bars and most other places. Wow. Because it helped people feel protected. And if you hear the language of the gun rights people, nobody's going to mess with us. Hello, you're messed with all the time. Things are a mess. And your gun won't help you. That's denial. Where you act like what happened didn't really happen. That's sort of like what Trump did with the election. I didn't lose the election. I'm a winner. Everybody else cheated. And it's sort of cute because he says that, having claimed he won the election, but if you win two elections as president, you can't run again. Hello? But that's denial too. And so America has suffered in the same way as people suffer psychology. In psychology language, they suffer from depression, loss of interest in life, loss of incentive, loss of hope, being sad, wanting drugs to feel better. That's what's happened to the United States. Dissociation and from some people, denial. We have lost the wars. We cannot sustain an empire. We are in, we have bases, 800, I think it's in 800 places around the globe, there are American bases, and we don't win. We need the money from the military to build this country, to give people a chance, to give people a future. And the good news after all this bad news of all those D-downers, depression, dissociation, denial, and displacement, is it is also a time for hope. It's a time when, in spite of the AFL-CIO not being a leader, with the exception of people like the Nurses' Union and also Sarah Nelson of the flight attendants, 
labor is walking out. People are saying, we know we're important. We were essential, and it wasn't essential to pay us well. Well, hello. We're tired of getting a median wage of $20 an hour when we're the ones making you rich. Many people are aware that the billionaires in the United States made $70 billion during the pandemic when so many other people were pushed down into poverty. And they're saying, no, we are important. Our work has dignity. Our work has importance. Words unionization is going up, whereas it had gone down before as people were in denial and in depression and dissociated and displaced. Because what heals people is the determination that we can recapture this nation. We can join other people. We can make it happen. We can connect with each other and disconnect from the screen all day. We can unionize, and there's been a big spur in unionization. There's even a periodical which anyone can get called Payday Report by Mike Elk, which lists the thousands of strikes that people haven't even seen in the newspaper, because newspapers are usually not so big on labor. People have a sense that they're not going to work and be abused at work. They have a sense of dignity. That's why 13 million people have left their jobs in the United States. It's a lot. People are starting to connect. Organizations like Black Lives Matter, like the Sunrise Movement and all and climate extinction, all these movements. No, we want our planet back and we can have the power. We don't have to deny it. We don't have to displace our anger. We don't have to dissociate in front of screens. We can connect with each other and get our country back and our dream of a better life for all of us back. The DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, is growing by leaps and bounds as people want to join a socialist dream of a better world and a better society. And people are aware of class. They're aware that billionaires have made billions and not paid any taxes on them because they can afford the slickest tax lawyers that work the system so they get Bezos got a refund. They can get refunds off of us, and Trump can brag that he doesn't pay taxes. They're getting sick of it. And there's the healing after all these D-downers. The healing is we can connect. We can reclaim America. We can realize we are the work that makes everything possible. We are the work that made you rich. And we can take that money back And we can take it back from a military that fails everywhere and makes military corporations. Military, if you invested in the military at the beginning of the pandemic, you'd make 100% profit because they keep selling arms. And you can instead spend those trillions of dollars, the two trillion, for example, you spent on losing Afghanistan, on redoing America on giving people a chance, on passing the bills for everything, on hiring the 22 million people, which would be the equivalent of what people demanded and FDR did, to to beautify our cities, to create dams, to create safety, to create infrastructure. It wouldn't be like Biden's bill where you hire the road corporation. You hire people directly if the profiteers won't hire them. And you make them rebuild this country. And you repopulate our schools. So in public schools, kids get the education they need. They have enough staff. I have a client who's a public school teacher in a very nice school where there's an insane child that runs back and forth, hitting himself on the walls all day because they don't have the staff to take care of him. 
and because his mother won't get him the help he needs because she denies that he's needing help. I have another public school teacher client who has to put one child 10 feet away from the others because the child is so paranoid. He accuses people of looking at him in a destructive way or being attacking him or about to attack him and he runs over and hits and bites them. But they don't have the personnel to take care of that child. And these are earnest, hardworking school teachers in fairly decent schools that are overwhelmed by the level of problems they have because they don't have enough staff to help. And all those things are, of course, possible. We're still the richest country in the world. It's just that the money is going to the top. We're the most unequal of all the advanced nations. In 1970, we were the most egalitarian, the most equal. Now we are the least equal, and we can equalize it. That's the good news at the end of all these D-downers. We have to join together, and we have to change this country on the basis of class solidarity for all of us and recognition that we need each other. We are the majority. They have the money, but we have the majority of people. And they can't do it without us, as people have shown now in the pandemic, when they don't want to work at, at abusive, degrading jobs and are going on strike. We can do it. And we have to do it together. And that would be labor. That would be Black Lives Matter. That would be the whole climate movement. That would be the LGBTQIA movements. That would be the people who want the right to go into a bathroom that fit that matches their gender preference, all of those things. We can do it. That's the good news. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for suggesting this program to others. Thank you for being Patreon members. And thank you for Democracy at Work for sponsoring it and bringing it to you. Of course, we want your reactions, whatever they are. Send them to us. Send them to Democracy at Work. Capitalism hits home. Thank you so much. Goodbye.